Okay, great. All right, working with tradies. So if, we'll wait till the tradies go. I'm telling the real story. <laughs> go, guys. <laughs> I'm joking. All right, if you're going to have a renovation horror story, it probably will involve a tradie, okay? That is the reality. Um, there are reasons why renovation horror stories exist, and purely for me, it's a lack of communication and nothing more than that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people do try and wing renovating. They watch these renovating TV shows, and they think that, you know, it's just so easy, and it, you don't need to be organized in any way, shape, or form. So it's, it is about having clear communication, and, and, and as the guys have expressed here, you know, what they like about my sites is that there is a plan of works to be done they know what they've got to be what they've got to do when they've got to do it and when they've got to be out so they want to be organized as much as you okay so contrary to popular belief tradies aren't morons um, unfortunately a lot of people disrespect tradies and let me tell you they are very smart in what they did I actually started my builders license uh, a couple of years ago I'm actually about six months off being a licensed builder and I stopped doing my course because I actually realized one day that I didn't actually need to be a builder while it helps it's not essential and let me tell you I, I consider myself a reasonably smart person and I really struggled with that building course it was extremely hard so tradies are fairly intelligent particularly when you're looking at these hydraulic drawings and the structural engineering drawings and they're looking at spans and wind loads and all sorts of things these these tradies are quite intelligent unfortunately everybody thinks because they don't wear a suit every day that they don't have the intellectual capacity they're, they've got to resort to you know that brain and what's that saying brawn not brain or something um, they think that's the case who, who are the tradies in the audience uh, would you agree with me in some regards I'm a rocket you're a rocket science excellent what are you yeah so you, so you um so and so you're t uh tim tim Keith. So Keith's saying that he's done a couple of degrees. He's also got a builder's license and he found the builder's license quite difficult, harder than the other degrees. Um, for the other traders, who are the other traders we've got in the audience? Would you say that, uh, what sort of tradie are you? A landscaper. Would, so would you, assume, would you say that some people just don't give you any respect whatsoever because you're not in a suit? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, well, it's not great, but that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's the problem. Most people, they just, they show such disrespect to tradies, it's not funny. Had a couple of, yeah, got a story? I'm, I was walking down the street one time. So I'll grab the mic. It works both ways. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. I was walking down the street one time after I'd, uh, I'd left my job as a senior teacher and uh, I had some of my ex-students walk up to me and their parents come up to me and say, what are you doing now? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm doing carpentry. So I, that was my pre, pre preparatory work before I did building. Yep. And uh, they said, why are you doing that? You're going down in the world. And I looked at them and I thought, that's amazing. It's something that I absolutely love. Yeah. So, you know, like, why not do things that you actually yeah. enjoy doing? Absolutely. It was quite and a been, shock, actually. I've been told by tradies who, um, you know, like, for example, I had a couple of higher hubbies who, who came through my program in Perth, and they, they actually stood up in an audience like this, and they said, the way that some people treat us is disgusting. Like, one lady made them stand in the rain um, at the front of her house, like, and she wouldn't let them in. Like, she said, you know, go around the side, go around the side. You're not coming in with wet shoes in my house. And I just think, geez, and, you know, these people expect them to do good work for them so you if you are a genuinely nice person to your tradie they will want to do good work for you you don't want to be this person where you're going yes I want to uh, I want you to lay the pavers that way and you know that's what you don't want okay so uh, what I do is I actually adjust my language to suit my tradies as well so you just want to be conscious of that as a, as a professional renovator it's sort of like you juggle a couple of roles when you're dealing with your architect or whatever you go more into professional mode Mode. when you're down on the site with your tradies you know you change your language so I don't know if you sort of change like noticed how my language I didn't if I, I don't know if you changed it saw it or not but I sort of sort of just sort of took a bit more a lot more casual friendlier approach because you want to be on site and while you want to be professional you also want to have like a bit of a laugh and a bit of a joke because that's what that's the fun factor on your site and if your tradies think yeah Cherie's a tough person she knows what she's doing she's super organized but you know what she's um 
you know what? She's a good person underneath all of that. She, you know, she's a good person. She cares about me on site. She does the little things like the coffees and the teas. So that's what can get your tradie to really like you. There's no other magic formula, okay? But the reality is if they like you, they will help you. You can go to them. You can ask questions. So you can say to them, Mark, I don't, what is that? I don't really understand what that is. What is that? Or how do you do that? When you've got that relationship with your tradies, they will be more than welcome to help you and answer those questions. They won't look down on you. They'll be more than and happy to help you and that's how you can increase your learning as well okay you're going to be dealing with lots of tradies i'm not going to go through all of those but you're going to be dealing with about 40 or 50 different style of tradies so um, each of them have their own little quirky um, details and so i will go through some of those in a little bit detail Quick question there i've had a similar experience with that gentleman there i'm a landscaper as well and we're in the middle of summer which is about 50 degrees in perth and I was doing some uh, paving down the dead side of the house, which is the hot side, and the lady turned the air conditioner on, so when it goes cool inside, it goes hot, and so it's blowing hot air on me, so I asked her to, um, you know, if you could just turn it off, and wasn't interested, and so that was about a $100,000 job to, to me, and so I would not always do a good job, but she didn't get the extra bit that That's exactly she right. would have got. That's it, that exactly right. She didn't get the extra bit. If she was a nice person, so if, that, if that was me on site, and I know you were like slogging your guts out in the absolute heat, I'd say, you know, do you, wanna, do you want me to go grab you a cold drink from the shop or do you want, he, here's some water. Do you want me to grab you a drink of water from the, the spring water on, on site? Do you want, that's what I would do, okay? And then that would make you like me and that's where you would not take shortcuts, correct? The other tradies in the room, would you agree with that? Yep, they're all shaking their heads. Yes. Okay, so not, not a hard thing. So just be conscious of the small details on site because particularly for all the ladies in the audience, um, I think you've probably got a better ability to do this than the fellas. The fellas, you're, you already know you're one step ahead of the ladies in that regard, okay? So ladies, you can sort of bring yourself up to speed and probably pay more attention to that. And I quite find as a, as a woman on a construction site too, the guys are also... More, um, more receptive to helping me. It's like the little sister on a construction site as well. So guys are pretty good with that. Um, would you say that with the tradies in the audience? You know, trying to help. If you can see a female on site having a go, trying to make it, she's doing her best, regardless of her lack of knowledge, would you be more willing to help her? Yes. Okay, there's different authorities in each state that monitor your tradies, the trade licensing. Um, we've already gone through this, uh, briefly touched on it yesterday, the BSA in Queensland, Department of Fair Trading in New South Wales, the Government of South Australia in, in Adelaide, um, and the Painters Registration Board and the Plumbers Board in Perth, and the Victorian Building Commission in Melbourne. So if you are having an issue with your tradies, you can go to those government of, um, bodies. A lot of those government bodies have mediation services and they can help you with disputes as well. Okay, um, you do need a white card. Sorry, Jules, can I have your white card up on stage? That would be great. Every tradesperson has to be licensed in Australia, okay? Um, plumbers, uh, and, ag and again, it varies by state. Um, in some states, for example, in, in WA, you need, to be, you need to have a license if you're a painter. Um, so it just varies in most states. But generally assume that most tradespeople have to be licensed, okay? So they have to have undergone some degree of training and they need a special license. So you always need to check their license as part of your site induction before they come on site. Also, um, now anybody that is working on your site, even if you've got a labourer, um, anybody, they must have a construction white card. This is actually a construction, thanks Jules, this is a construction white card. So all of you now as professional renovators need to go and actually just sit your white card training. Um, we've organised some, um, we don't... Uh, we don't provide this training, we're not licensed to, it's only accredited certifiers under Department of Fair Trading. Um, we do run white card training sessions in our Balmain office, so you can certainly come in. The sessions that we've got booked in now, they can only, they're, the provider is only allowed to train 20 people at a time. So we have some sessions booked in for Saturday the 28th of May for all the Sydney people. Okay, there's a session from 8 till 2.30 and another session from 3 to 9.30 p.m. And there's a session on Sunday the 29th of May from 8 a.m. to 2.30. It's about $100. Um, you'll basically go through a lot of the stuff that I've just covered with you this morning in terms of your site establishment. You'll walk out of that course with one of these and this basically this licence will give you the ability to work on any construction site right across Australia, okay? So you all must undergo. So as project managers, you require this white card. Uh, I won't pass it around because it's got Julie's birth date on it. 
Um, so they're all changing it right. So it used to be called the green card, red card, blue card, white card. Now they've changed it, thank goodness, to the white card right across the whole country. So you may have your red, your red card. You should go and now do your white card again because that's technically not compliant now. All right, so you need to go get the new updated and once you've got that, you're good to go. Now, so if, you, if a ranger comes out on site and you've got any workers, not just your own workers, but any tradies on site that don't have their white card, even builders need to have a white card. Okay, so it's a bit of a duplication of training, but anybody that doesn't have a white card on site and the ranger comes out, you will get fined. That can actually stop work on your site. Um, no, 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 it doesn't expire at all. Yep, so once you've done it, you've, it's good to go. And it's like $90, $100, $120. Now, be careful, guys. Um, they've changed the regulations with the white card. There's still a lot of online um, training providers, and they provide very quick white card courses on the internet. They're not recognised by Department of Fair Trading. So you now, there's only about 20 accreditors um, in each, uh, over, the, you know, over various states. And so you have to basically do a Department of Fair Trading or those government bodies in your state. It has to be an accredited certifier by those government bodies in your own respective state. So make sure you don't get tripped up on that. Don't go do a two hour course online, pay 50 bucks because you might as well just rip it up. It's not worth the, the thing that's printed on. So how do you know that people have done it through the correct people or not? Will they still get a card? Um, that you need to look for the symbol for the, um, okay. the like this is work cover. Okay. Um, so it's the work cover card, okay. work, cover, work cover symbol. Yeah. Yep. What's that? Yeah, and you have to have it all the time on site. So you may have one, and if you forget it at home that day, or one of your workers forgets it, um, and a ranger comes out, you're in trouble. So you, as part of your site induction, you have to say, um, have you got your white card? Okay. Uh, look, if you've got a copy, they may forgive you, but you should always try and have the real thing. Yep. Okay, insurances, tradies insurances. Your tradies are going to have two types of insurances. You're going to have home warranty insurance and you're also going, sorry, you need home warranty insurance for any works that are over. Typically, look, it varies by each state. Some states it's 10,000, some it's 12,000, some it's 11,000. I've just basically averaged it out at 10,000 or more. But for any works over 10,000 or more, you will need a certificate of home warranty insurance. Now, your tradie will provide that to you for any works over that amount. So you have to make sure that as renovators, you get that home warranty certificate as part of your scope of works. What you can do if you're doing an owner builder project, you can actually get one home warranty insurance policy for the whole house and you get that through that company um, Build Safe Insurances in Melbourne, okay? We are going to be doing more research into all of that because I recognise you know, there's probably a bit more information needed for our graduates on that front, so there will be some more information. And Julie, if you can just make a note of that for me as well. Thank you. All right, um, as I said, if you have a trade or a client dispute, tradie, uh, client tradie dispute, there are those mediation services, those government bodies in every single state that have me in-house mediators that can help you work through issues. Okay, if it's, if it's possible, the same way that I have a cookie cutter approach to my renovation projects, try and have a cookie cutter approach to your trade team as well. You're going to find you have your good tradies, your bad tradies, you know, there's particular tradies that I love working with. So, you know, if I want cabinets, I'll ring Maroon. Maroon is my first preference straight off the bat to basically call my mad cabinet maker. Nine out of ten times, you know, he'll drop everything and he'll do my job for me. So I love working with him in that respect. So when your tradies like working with you, you'll like working with them. And it just means when you have those really good relationships, you can literally ring up those tradies at the 11th hour and, you know, they'll drop, they'll, not, all the, uh, not all the time, but, you know, they'll be more willing to sort of drop things or try and work around situations to be on your site when you absolutely need them to be there. So that's what you want to aim for. You want to aim for your core tradie. So your favourite, you know, your preferred electrician, your preferred plumber, your preferred carpenter, cabinet maker and so on. Okay, briefing and managing tradies. This is where you start with the process. Pretty much, you've got an unrenovated house, you need to start organising quotes for things. So as a project manager, when you do your property inspection checklist where you go through on a room by room basis, that process is going to identify what work you need to be done. So get into the habit of organising at least three to five quotes for absolutely everything that you need to do, okay? Now, I'll tell you why you need three to five quotes. Let's say, for example, you want to get your bathroom tiled. 
you're going to install a complete new bathroom. Guys, by the way, as professional renovators, you don't need to get a bathroom company in to do the whole renovation for you. That's weekend warrior mode, okay? So um, you can basically handle that as project managers very, very easy. Let's say you want to get your bathroom tiled. Let's say the tilers come in. If you get three to five quotes, I'll, I'll show you how you basically go about determining which trader you should give the job to. Let's say a quote comes in at $1,000 from one trader, so that's Q1, quote one. Q2, another one comes in at $1,650. Another one comes in at $1,450. Another one comes in at $1,800. And another one comes in at 2450 Where do you think the real cost where do you think the real cost of that job really lies And what price range Yeah it's basically somewhere around Yes, yeah, it's, it's somewhere between, you know, 15 to 1700 probably. That's probably the true value of the work, okay? Now, how on earth, when you just go and get one quote, what can you benchmark it against? Okay, and that's a problem. Everybody is so unorganized on their renovation sites, they ring up the last moment, the 11th hour, they organize one, or they might ring three tradies, only one comes out to quote. They get one quote and they try and haggle from that. It could be a high quote, it could be a low quote. You don't know. You've got nothing to benchmark what the true cost is. So if you can, and this is why part, be part of you being organized, if you're organized, you'll have time to actually organize what you should be doing as a project manager, which is getting lots of quotes and comparing prices. So so when you get five quotes, you're going to be in a much better position, even with no knowledge of construction, to know what the true cost of a job should be. What this is saying to me is this tradie here is probably taking some shortcuts, either got no work and just wants the work, desperate for work, or is taking some shortcuts using cheaper materials or just cutting some processes. So this for me would probably be a questionable quote. This one here has clearly got too much work or is just work up specking the quality. So they may be doing a fantastic job, but basically um, just you know over specifying things or using a better quality adhesive or whatever it may be. So that's definitely not the true value. And so what I do is I basically go, I go back to these. Now what I would probably be inclined is, is to go to the person that quoted um, quote four, $1,800, and start to move them down closer to the 1500 range. So what I do is let's say, let's say um, Sam sends us this, Sam is the person who sent us quote four. I'd ring up Sam and say, look, Sam, always thank tradies for sending in your quote. Say, Sam, thank you very much for sending in that quote. I appreciate it. Sam, look, I've got five quotes for, the, for that job that you needed to quote on. Look, to be honest with you, the quotes range, I got a quote for $1,000. I got another one for um, $1,450. So the general range of quotes was about $1,500, Sam. So you were definitely one of the more expensive quotes and you're not telling a lie there. So Sam, I'd really like to give you the job. Is it possible you could do the job for $1,500 just in line with all the other quotes that I got. What do you think they're going to say? They'll say, yeah, yeah, okay, that's no problem. Or they may say, no, I'm sorry, much dig their heels in the ground and basically um, say, you know, no, I'm not going to move, that's my price. But very rarely I've had that happen to me. So most credits, if you say it in that regard, then most credits will, um, most traders will just basically relook at their pricing and they'll say, yeah, I can move, that's no problem, I can do that for you. So you just need to have those conversations and that's how, you know, instead of just paying $1,800 straight off the bat, you know, you can save $300 just on one particular piece of work. But you, it's very hard for you to do that when you don't have more than one quote because you've got nothing to benchmark it off. Okay, interview the tradie. So the process is, is that you get, sorry, process is you organise three to five quotes. So organise, you know what work needs to be done, organise the tradie to come out, organise three to five tradies to come out and quote on that job. Now when a tradie comes out, what you want to give them is you want to give them your scope of works document. Now in your system, I've done a scope of works document for every single tradesperson that you're going to need on your renovation project. So there's about 40 or 50 scope of works documents on your disk. Um, now what you need to do is this.
So I'm just going to take you through this. Now, what I give my tradies is a little pack. Many of you would have remembered this from when I spoke at my preliminary um, seminars. So quite often when I'm engaging a tradie, I will give them a small pack like this. So what you want to do is when your tradie comes out, and this is why it's important to have a little printer and your laptop so you can continue giving this work on site, I give them this Scope of Works document, which is basically a briefing document of how things work on my site, okay? So I'll just quickly go, I'm not going to read this, I'm going to just skim through the main parts because you can certainly read it in your manuals. But what it's saying is, um, this one here is the electrical contractor, so what it's saying, the, the work involves the supply, equipment and labour in order to upgrade the electrical works in a single residential property. Um, the nature of our business. So it says here, our business relies on acquiring old properties, getting in, renovating them quickly, getting out and flipping them for a profit. It pretty much, that's the gist of what it says. You know, the site relies on contractors performing their duties according to the project plan, getting in out very quickly and not without sacrificing quality, okay? It talks about variations, how variations are going to be handled. So if there is a change to the scope of work, um, they must sign the variation form. They sign it, I sign it, and then work and can commence. Uh, it goes through the building codes and standards, occupation health and site, site, site safety. So it talks, you know, it says here, the project manager holds a basic inventory of safety attire, earplugs, respirators, gloves. If you need them, please see the project manager. Um, please alert the project manager if there's any potential hazards or safety risk on site. You know, site safety is not my responsibility, it's also your responsibility as well. All employees will be licensed to have a white card, blah, 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 blah. Contractor insurances. The contractor must have a photocopy. You must supply. Before you start work on site, I must cite your, your public liability insurance policy, your workers comp, and also I need a photocopy of your contractor license. That is where you're going to pick up. Now, some tradies who aren't licensed, they're not even going to bother submitting a quote because they can't fulfill that right there and then. So you'll, you'll cull them there. Professionalism, conduct. You know, you say this site's a drug and alcohol free zone. Um, you might have remembered me spoken, speaking about that. Don't always assume, particularly with young labourers and things, young workers on site, um, they go out and, you know, have joints or whatever, you know, they smoke all sorts of things, not everybody obviously, but an example of that was, you know, one day last year, one of the workers on my site um, was uh, under the influence of marijuana, you know, I just thought he was really happy that day, but um, it was for other reasons, so, you know, I obviously had to put him in a taxi and get him off site because, you know, being under the influence of drugs, accidents happen. So there's a whole heap of stuff in these, um, these scope of works documents that just talk about all sorts of things, you know, don't park over the neighbour's driveway, please respect the neighbours don't be noisy, um, you know, clean up after your own mess, we don't have magical fairies on site, all that sort of stuff. So um, go through the construction project plan, you're given a copy of the project plan, um, your, your, your lines of responsibility have been um, uh, you know, highlighted, blah, blah, blah. Um, I give them all a copy of the documentation, so building plans, specifications, whatever they need to do their job. And I specifically state here the payment of their invoices. So what I say is that contractors are required to submit their invoices by 3 p.m. every Friday afternoon. So they come in and they give me their invoices. When I wrap up on site in the afternoon, I go home on a Friday afternoon, I direct debit, I pay all the invoices by direct debit. It takes half an hour, it's done, they're all happy, okay? If you really want to lose your tradespeople, guess what you do? Don't pay them, okay? Um, the tradies, uh, is this a problem? Big, big problem, okay? So um, I've become a favourite client of many tradies purely for the fact that I pay them on time. Um, so it, it saves those uncomfortable questions for them, from them coming up to you on site saying, Cherie, um, can I get some cash off you? Or, you know, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rocco, but we don't do cash. Um, we do AFP, and they're going to think, oh, Cherie. Mm. So when you just spill it out, they know what they're in for. Um, at the back of this document, guys, there is two pages, and you can obviously extend it if you want, but there's a couple of pages that say what are the specific tasks they are being hired to do. So let's, for example, let's say as renovators, you want to paint your house. So you don't, this doesn't need to be a thesis. It can be a simple, a couple simple lines that say, if you want to paint your house, sand, sand um, prepare walls, you know, um, fill, fill and sand walls, put one coat of undercoat, put two coats of paint. That is it across the whole house. And I would say in bedroom one, bedroom two, bedroom three, bedroom four, on the outside of the house, the carport, whatever, like spell it out in that detail so there's no misunderstandings. So then they will go away, they will quote on that. Um, now the reality is some, some tradies are going to get that document and what are they gonna say? Too much, too hard. But would you rather get rid of them then or would you rather have an issue three quarters of the way through the site? The tradies in the room, um, let's do a test. So what's your name? 
Nick? So, Nick, if you got that document, what would you think? And thoughts would be fantastic. Yeah, that's right. So it could go either way, couldn't it? So it depends on how good the tradie is. If the tradie is a professional, they will love it. And if they're not a professional, they'll probably hate it. I want professional people dealing on my sites, not amateurs or time wasters. So make sure you use that. So what you're going to do is you're going to give that. So this is what you can print out during the day on site. That's why you should have that little laptop on your site. Keep these things pumping out. So instead of you having to say, look, I'll email you something tonight when I get home, you do it during the day, you print it out, they take it away with them, and you've got a better chance of your quote coming back much sooner because they walked away from the site with that document. So the tradie will visit the site. You'll tell them what you need to do. Now, at this point, you guys may not know what needs to be done in terms of the work, the scope of work and how things get done, correct? So what you can do is you can also camouflage your lack of knowledge. Um, I'll give you an instance. Last year when I did my pinball house, it was the very first double brick house um, I'd ever built. I had no idea how to build it. And so there were certain like, really basic things. like I didn't know how the architrave went around a double skin brick wall. I had no idea. I knew it had to be done. So I'd bring the tradies out and I'd basically you know, always greet your tradies at the front gate when they come in like always go out I always put my hand out I'm always very close I don't care who they are I will or how grubby they look I will always shake their hand okay just good good manners and then I'll take them through the property and I'll always say, say thank you for coming out appreciate it always very polite in that regard I will take them through and I'll say look I need to get the architraves installed around the door how would you actually go about doing this what's the process you would follow so what you can do is actually so instead of them saying what do you want done and you're just saying what architraves done, I actually throw it back to them saying, look, I, need, I know I need architraves on the door, so what would be the process? How would you go about doing it? And you can sort of camouflage your lack of knowledge like that. So the first person will come out and they'll say, oh, I just I would glue the architraves or I drill, I dowel, whatever. So when the next tradie comes out, you can say, how would you go about the process? Would you drill or dowel? Or, and you probably don't even know what that means, but hey, you sound good, all right? So that's how you can camouflage your lack of, lack of knowledge. And look, it's just the more renovation sites you do, um, your first one's obviously going to be the hardest. Your second one is going to be a lot easier. Your third one, you're going to start to get the hang of it, and then you're going to start doing it with your eyes closed. All right, so the project manager briefs the tradie on site in terms of what they need. The tradie takes away the scope of document. The tradie submits their quote. And then you as a project manager will basically look at the quotes and your review and you'll basically try and pick one of the ranges and try and get them down a little bit. Because if you can save $100 here, $300 there, $400 there, it adds up to massive, massive amounts of money, particularly if you're doing a structural renovation over the course of six months. Okay. When you decide you um, want to go ahead with a tradie, uh, what I would suggest you do is you give them this little information pack. So what I do is I'll actually just pop it in the mail to them, so I just print these templates out. So what I do is any contact details on who's working on the project, I fill out that trade team. So this is a different trade team template to your general trade directory. Your trade directory is your smallest board of, direct of tradies, and this one is who's working on this specific project. So I'll give this to my tradies because, for example, if the plumber's on site and there's a problem with the pits and I'm at my full-time job, then the plumber's more likely to phone the hydraulic engineer on site rather than bother me at my full-time job. So some, the tradies can sort of sort out some of their own issues between themselves. I have the details, obviously, of my consultant team, so who my suits are, that are involved in the project. I have the um, the local gov the government, the Department of Fair Trading building contracts. So for all the New South Wales people and all the Queensland people, these all of these contracts are currently on your disc in Melbourne, South Australia, and WA. You have to purchase them from the Master Builders Association or the Housing Industry Association. Okay, they don't have them for free in those states, unfortunately. So make sure don't ever enter into a building contract for any major like. If you're getting somebody in a bricklayer for $350 a day and they're only going to be there one day, you probably don't need to go to this level of documentation, okay? <coughs> but for anything over 1000 or 2000 I would strongly encourage you to basically follow these documentation. Okay, you, obviously you send, them the scope, you, you send them the scope of works document again in the actual pack. And then you've got your contract variation. So there's a template there in your system, so you don't have to create your own for variation. So you just get them to fill out that form. So just have a stash of these on site in your project manage in your site management files. You know, just of all of these templates, they fill it out. You fill it out. You've agreed to what the, the you know if you do forget anything which you will in your first couple of projects. They sign it, you sign it, away you go, and you won't have any dispute afterwards. Because if you don't manage variations, that's like a, a piece of string that never ends. 
and you give them a copy of the project plan with their name on it, with, the, with their details filled out and basically um, their name highlighted, okay? So that they know what day. So when they see here that they've got to be on site on you know, 16th of April, they know, they can see that the plumber's coming in on the 17th to rough the pipes in, they know they've got to be there. They're going to be more accountable when they're given a deadline. All right. Question at the back? Um, just going back to the other document um, that you give the tradie when they're quoting, um, I imagine most tradies would just sort of chuck it aside and not read it. Um, do you actually go through it with them right then and there and sort of just pull out key points? Um, I don't typically. Like I, I ask them, look, have you, have you read through the Scope of Works document? And they'll say yes. So, I mean, you can, if you want to get down to that level, you can, I'd certainly encourage you. Always better to be safe than sorry, isn't it? So but I don't typically, I just make sure I say, I always say, look, if you, you've read through the Scope of Works document. In fact, you just sort of uh, motivated me maybe to adjust my site induction checklist to maybe, Julie, can you put that down, please? I'll just double check that. Um, so as part of the site induction, when they, when they come on site for the very first day, it's probably a good question to ask them in the site induction, have you read, fully read the scope of works document that you were sent as part of being awarded to the job? So if that's not built into that, I'll make sure it, it does get, bit, get built into that and we'll email that back out. Okay, building contracts, construction contracts. Look, there's lots of different types of building contracts around. We're going to speak to Michael, the builder, about those this afternoon. I've got a whole heap of building contracts here that I'm going to pass around, so certainly feel free to have a look at them. Your, your housing industry association, um, your local state government, like your Department of Fair Trading, um, Big Victorian Building Commission, all of those government bodies have lots of different types of building contracts. So we'll talk about those in detail with Michael the Builder. So I'll sort of split these up and pass them around. But I guess as renovators, what you want to be aiming for is fixed price building contracts. Remember I said you want to be aiming for fixed price wherever possible in any way, shape or form. All right, so I'll pass those around, just keep them all circulating and having a look around. So there's fixed price, there's cost plus, there's all sorts of building contracts. Okay. What we might do is, I'd, I'm conscious of not keeping Michael um, any longer, so what I might do is I might bring um, Michael up, who looks like Jamie Jury, I think. Um, so, <laughs> and so, <laughs> I always embarrassing. So what we're going to do, we're going to bring Michael up. So we're, I'm a little bit behind schedule and I don't want to keep Michael too much longer. I normally bringing up, bring Michael up in the section of working with builders, but we'll bring up a little a bit earlier. So I know he's a family man, he wants to get home to his kids. So Michael, welcome up to the stage. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you? Hi. Okay. Cute, huh? <laughs> <laughs> this is how you get on the favourite list on your on your tradies. Okay. All right. Um, basically, Michael, we're talk, We're going to be talking about builders. So, wanted um, obviously the objective. I've embarrassed him. I embarrassed myself as well. So, um, what you want to do is you want to get into a good relationship. A lot of you are structural renovators, won't even be on site. So it's good to know the whole process of how a builder, because reality is if you're not a project manager on site, managing your structural renovation, you will have a builder like Michael who will be basically managing the whole process and they will basically be doing everything. They'll just basically be taking all of the responsibility that I've just showed you today and basically managing that whole process from start to finish. So Michael, in terms of people working with builders, where do they start? These guys have just got their plans approved development approved plans, they get for a structural renovation, where do they start in terms of finding a builder? I like the recommendation system. Um, everybody knows someone that's had something done, whether it be a, a bathroom renovation or a backyard extension or a top floor addition. Um, I, I always like to tell people, go and look at the work that's been recommended as well, not just take somebody's word, because everyone's interpretation of a good job is a little bit different to somebody else's. Also, Whilst you're there, chat to the uh, friend or client or whoever it is that you're, you're dealing with on the relationship of the construction throughout the period. So making sure that not only did the job get done, it got done right, it got done on time, it got done on budget, and you had a good relationship along the way. So there weren't any disputes over variations or uh, unforeseen things. Um, once, you, once you sort of have a fair idea of who you want to quote your work, do your background checks. Um, if they're a company, you can ring ASIC or you can get on the ASIC site, do a company check on their licence to make sure that they haven't been uh, in any trouble in the past with anything. 
Um, you can also get on to um, Office of Fair Trading as well. And, uh, or you can also Google someone's name too to make sure that they haven't been in any trouble or had any uh, class actions uh, against them. So once you're confident with a couple of people or two or three that you have, then you get your quotes. So once you give them a job description and plans of exactly what it is that you're after, you let them come back to you with your quotes and then you go through the quotes in detail, making sure that you're comparing apples with apples. The biggest thing that builders like to do is mess around with the PC items. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the PC items, PC items are things like your toilets, your vanities, your shower screens, the things that we put a value to based on the information that you give us. And builders will generally keep these items down low purposely to make their quotes look attractive. So you want to make sure that you don't just look at the final figure, but you look at all the other little finer bits along the way too, because that can make a huge difference when you're talking two or three bathrooms. Uh, if there's an allowance for $200 for a toilet as opposed to $1,000, or if there's a kitchen and they've only allowed 10,000 and you know that the other guys are allowed for 20,000. So these are the things that a lot of people overlook. They go straight to the last page and bingo, that's, that's, that's all they're interested in. That's exactly right. In fact, one of my students in Brisbane has been tripped up on this in a major way uh, where the builder, she's basically got into a big dispute with the builder and it was basically over the cost of the contract. He'd made allowances, um, he'd basically made allowance for, uh, same situation, a couple of bathrooms and he allowed about $1,000 for everything in the bathroom. So the tiles, the taps, the toilets, it was totally unrealistic. So when I had to look through that contract for her, I said, these figures should never have been signed off because it's unrealistic to think you can buy a tap, a toilet, a shower, tiles for $1,000. That should be like three, dollars $4,000. So subsequently, she was about $12,000 out of pocket because she hadn't actually looked through the fine print in the details. So when you're dealing with building contracts, you have to read every single page all through the fine print. You need to make sure that the architectural plans, the structural plans that the builder is going to be building for you are attached to that contract and those PC items are referenced from that building contract in the actual contract, okay? You need to make sure the quotes are realistic. More times than not, we don't get given a lot of information when we're quoting. And um, look, you should really get a, a job description and give people like myself uh, an indication of roughly what you're trying to achieve and how much money you really want to spend on some of these PC items. Um, look, I gauge my, my numbers from, from what I, the information that I'm given on the day that I meet with people. If you can't uh, give an indication, then I'll put those numbers in for you. Um, once you have those numbers, it's a good idea to actually go out and shop around and see what those numbers actually get you. Because if you're not happy with a $200 toilet, then you need to speak up before you get to, to the next stage because that will affect your final uh, costings. Yep. And if you can, when you're signing build, building contracts, can you try and please aim for finalised drawings, not preliminary drawings? That was another mistake that my Brisbane student made, is that she had got her builder to originally quote on some preliminary drawings. So she signed the contract off at that point, and she should have signed the contract off at basically um, the final point when the, drawing, the, the plans were approved and they were final. So there was obviously variations in there. So it was a real grey hole in that respect. Um, different types of building contracts, Michael? Okay, well there's a few different ones. Uh, look, all, all, all the big companies are making them. The Master Builders Association are making it. Uh, Housing Industry Association are making them. And the Office of Fair Trading are also making them. I find that the, the Master Builders and the Housing Industry Association contracts tend to favour the builders a little bit more, whereas the Office of Fair Trading tends to favour the, the clients. So you may want to look at all of them and see what's going to work best for you. And in terms of the type, we've got all the different types of building contracts. We've got fixed okay. price, cost price. Do you want to go through the different types okay. of building contracts? Look, fix, uh, fixed price uh, contracts are generally the best. In some instances, you can't have a fixed sum, and I'll get to that in a minute. Fixed sum means start to finish uh, with PC item allowances in there as well. Now, they're a fixed sum, but they, that will go up and down depending on your taste and budget. Um, the other one, the um, cost plus seems to be a favourite for some builders, it, it covers them, so they know that if they've underestimated somewhere, they're not going to lose out. They know they make their margin on top of every single trade, but with cost plus, you need to know a base number before you get into a cost plus situation. So you need to have estimates on every single component so that you can gauge where you stand before you actually get there, because cost plus can get dangerous for the client. Okay, and then the main two? 
They're the main two. Yeah. So as renovators, what pro which contract do you think you're more likely to be using or aiming for? Fixed, Fixed price yeah. contract, okay? Because you don't want any, uh, you know, loose ends, any variable sliding scales. All right, um, Michael. Um, now, just one thing you need to be mindful of, and that I'm conscious of. Um, certain builders build certain housing styles as well. well that's the other thing. Some guys specialise in um, new houses. They might just do townhouses, villa house, villa homes. Um, other guys might specialise in renovations and extensions, and others might specialise in commercial work, and others might just do high-end housing. So you need to find the type of builder that specialises in the type of work you're doing. So if you're doing a backyard extension, there's no point in getting somebody that does office fit-outs because they might not be compatible for your type of work. So you need to find the guys that specialise in your type of uh, work. And even, even with, um, like, so you might find a builder that does residential homes, but even some builders specialise in federation homes, some specialise in modern contemporary homes. Like some builders will come in and just want to put shadow line when you might have thought they're putting cornices in and all that sort of stuff. Have you seen that happen? Or Well, yes and no. Look, builders are pretty crafty. They can adapt to whatever yeah. taste that you have. But there's a difference between taste and the type of construction. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure most guys can, uh, can adapt. All right, now how do builders work in terms of how do builders get paid? <laughs> how do they get paid? Well, yeah, how much money do they make typically? Is that uh, what you want to know? Yes. Let's take a sense, what would you guess, what sort of profit margin do you think? Uh, Michael is a normal uh, residential builder. Um, he's a very good builder. I shouldn't yeah. say normal, you're not normal. Um, really? So, <laughs> not normal in a good way, right? Um, when I say that, I mean <laughs> exceptional, right? Um, so. What sort of profit margin do you think Michael would make uh, as a residential builder? 20%? 30%? Yeah. As much as possible, yes. I'll Michael? take that one. <laughs> <laughs> now look, it varies from anywhere between 15 and 25%. Um, I generally work with the economic climate that we're currently in. If, if it looks like there's a lot of work around and we don't need so much work, we can afford to, to up our margins. If there's no work around and we want to be competitive, we do want to drop our rates, obviously without cutting our own throat, just to win the work. So the other things that will um, regulate how much margin we put on are things like the difficulty of the job, um, access, uh, difficulty of the client. Uh. So the key there is be easy to deal with. Don't be a pain in the bum. Um, you know, say, are you going to be there? Like when somebody says, are you going to be there tomorrow afternoon? Don't go, are you going to be there by what time? 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m.? That's the quickest way to burn your tradies and your builders. Yeah. But the size of the job too. On a, on a little job, sometimes it doesn't pay you just to put a 15% margin on. It doesn't leave you enough leeway for, for incidentals. So on a larger job, there generally is a little bit more of a buffer. So, yeah, that, that's the other one. So what you're saying, Michael, if somebody came to you with a $100,000 job, your profit margin on that job is 20000 For argument's sake, yes. So it's actually not a lot, is it? No. So, um, yeah. Now, do tradies make any money anywhere else along the line? <laughs> tradies or builders? Builders. Oh, they do. They generally, look, the variations are really the cream of, uh, of our money. And sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's not. The one killer with uh, variations is once you get a bit of momentum going on a job and you have to start, readjust your, your, your materials, your, your setting out or whatever, you lose that momentum. So it's really hard to be compensated for that and we can't always be compensated enough mm. for those changes. So yeah, look, it's good and bad. Look, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it works in our favours, but to be totally frank, more times it doesn't. Yep, okay. All right. Um, now, in terms of the line of responsibility, if these renovators, for example, want to come in and they want to engage you or a normal builder as the builder of the project and they want to take it to just lock-up stage only, where you build the shell and then basically they come in as the renovator, have you ever worked in those situations? Yeah, in many instances we've worked like that. It works really well, provided that you keep the builders somewhat involved in the second stage of the work, even if it is just popping in one day a week just to keep an eye on things. The builder knows the setups, the things that have happened early in the job that make the second part of the job come together. Things like electrical, like plumbing, uh, provisions that are underground and un un unseen at a later stage of the job. The builder has records of every single one of these things. So when you get to the finishing stages, they can 
pretty much help you piece it all together without any problems. So would the builder then hand over certain documents to the renovators at the lock-up stage? Oh, how, hand... do you how do you normally Look, handle that with your clients? I'd like to somewhat be a little bit involved. Yep. Uh, only in certain components of the work. And look, it depends on the owners too, how confident they feel. Mm -hmm. If they feel it's their first job and they want to keep you a little bit involved in the second yep. part of the work, I think it's the best way to go. They, uh, it's like having a mentor there yep. to, to, to keep you in line throughout the whole process. Yep. And you can learn from that. And second time round, you might feel confident enough to want to do it yourself. Sure. And so in that situation where they want you sort of there as the, as the you know, the, the mentor, mm -hmm. how then do you work your rates? How do you charge that? Is it an hourly basis, daily basis, what? It depends how much they want me to be involved in it. Okay. Um, but let's say they wanted to engage you, just pop in for half a day, make sure everything's going fine, work in progress sort of meeting? It might just be a fixed rate for every time I come in. I might just okay. give them a, a, a sum and say whatever it is for, the, for half a day and I come in one day every week just to keep an eye on things. It doesn't have to be the same day. But uh, in saying that, I uh, generally like to keep the trades that do the rough in work, like your plumbers and your sparkies, keep them for the second component of the work because they've already done the setups initially. It's good to get them to finish. Yep. And so if I keep in with my guys, I can still liaise with these guys, even though I'm not physically there, and still make sure that everything stays on track. So, so most builders are happy. You're not even really paying for that, but it, it's something that people are getting because of the communication between subbies. Yeah. And so most builders are okay for those existing tradies to continue on? Oh, definitely. Is there, do you still get a kickback? No. No? no. After the, in the finishing stage? No, I don't get a kickback. I'm okay. not saying that it doesn't happen out there, yeah. but, but we don't operate that way. All right, cool. All right, now in terms of the line of responsibility, so Michael, you've taken my house up to lock-up stage. You've got all your temporary you know, your site, um, site establishment stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you then, with these cosmetic renovators or me coming in as a cosmetic renovator, what happens to all of that? You take your stuff out, mine comes in, like where's the line of responsibility in the changeover? I think it's important that the, uh, the client and the builder understand where the changeover is. Yeah. Um, things like site fencing, well, the, it's the owner's, uh, the onus is on the owner at that stage to continue the site fencing and all the site establishment costs, whether they be temporary services like temporary poles, like power poles, yep. temporary fencing, temporary toilets. So they need to understand what, what their role is. Um, as far as everything else is concerned, um, yeah, it's, once again, you just have to document everything yep. and give the owners something, maybe uh, an instructional guide on a step-by-step -step process of what they need to do to carry them through the rest of the job. So it, it isn't... It, it isn't really fair to, to say, well, I've done it to lock up, there you go, I'm walking away. You really have to give them something. And I think it's, it's the honourable thing to, to give them a little bit, like you said, a template maybe. Well, that's, you've already got the template, the society establishment mm -hmm. template. That's what you, you've already got that in your manuals right now. Yeah. So you've already got that. Yeah. So look, for, for me, leaving them in, in, in the dark doesn't do me any favours too because it reflects badly on, on us as well. Mm -hmm. So look, there's mandatory inspections that still need to be met after I've left. So these people need to know exactly what those inspections are, when they have to happen. And so if, if you walk off on them, then later on they're going to struggle to get an occupation certificate. So you really have done yourself an injustice and yeah. uh, harmed the client in the same token. Okay. And do you find most builders are on the tools these days or they're project managing the sites? I find the better ones are doing both. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, home warranty insurance? Okay. And where does that, where does that, because that's a real grey area, home warranty insurance, if the builder's taken it to lock up stage, then who's responsible? The cosmetic okay. fit out, the cosmetic renovator at the end, or the builder, the structural, okay. there's a real fine line. I, I guess to put it in an, an example, Michael comes and does all the roughing in the building for the plumbing lines, you know, the pipes are sticking out of the wall, ready for me to come in to do the cosmetic fit out, and suddenly there's a leak. My plumber installs the pipes, the plumbing pipes on, um, the taps on, sorry, and there's a leak. Now, whose fault is that? Is it Cherie, the cosmetic renovator, or is it Michael, the builder? Any comments about that or just ex personal experiences in terms of how to manage that? What's the best course of action? Well, I'll, I'll just step it back a little yep. bit, just so everyone understands what the homeowner's warranty does and how it works in the situation where you've got owner-builder and builder to lock up. Yep. Um, I'm in the process right now of doing exactly that. So. Once you engage a builder to do it to lock up, he needs his homeowner's warranty to get you to lock up. From there onwards, the owners are responsible for every single contractor that comes in, that's over $12,000 supply and install, to provide them with homeowner's warranty insurance. Um, some people don't realise the importance of this until it's too late. And I'll give you an example. 
Um, Woolen floor Tyler comes in, he does his work, the job's $20,000 to do all the bathrooms, living areas, so forth. And you think, well, it's only tiles, it's no big deal, the house isn't going to come down. And then all of a sudden you find the tiles are drummy. Drummy means when you, when you hit the tiles and, the, and they sound hollow. And chances are, if that happens in a bathroom, it's going to spread, it's going to get worse. And what do you do then? You have to pull everything up. If you've got things like underfloor heating in there, like waterproofing, all these things fall under the homeowner's warranty insurance. So he's not only just covering his work, he's covering the damage also that he could potentially be doing to someone else's uh, work. So you need to make sure that all the subbies uh, come in with a homeowner's warranty insurance, otherwise you'll be uh, fitting the bill out of your own pockets. Okay. Any questions for Michael as a builder? Mike runners, mics, come guys. Hi. Just um, in regards to um, building to lock up stage, so no PC items and so forth, in the current market, would you have a guide as, a, as far as a rate per square metre on space that's built? as a guide. I know I can't hold you to it, but it, it depends on the building and so forth. It really varies. Um, a lot of people underestimate it's not just the level of finish, but sometimes it's the size of the actual building. A bigger building will give you a, a smaller square metre rate because on, on a 200 square metre block, for argument's sake, you need to still fit in three bedrooms, a kitchen, two bathrooms. Yeah. And on a 700 square metre block where the house is physically bigger, you still need to do four bedrooms, mm. kitchen, bathroom. So the rates change just on that alone. And then there's the level of finishes as well. So it is really hard. The only way I could give you a square yeah. metre rate is if I knew roughly what you were trying to do. Okay. Are you talking uh, new average, work? Just, You're yeah. talking well, new work, renos? Add on. It can vary upstairs, anywhere from... Uh, yeah, back and up. <laughs> so it's changed yeah. already. Yeah, Look, it could up. be anywhere from two to $3,000. Yeah, as a guy, two to yeah. three, yeah. Just ballpark. Um, and, and also the type of construction, mm. whether it's brick veneer, double brick, clad. Mm. Okay, you, thanks. You typically have, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, because um, you're more close to this than what I am, but you typically have three tiers of builders. You basically have your base budget builders. You have your um, medium, like your medium tier. And then you have your premium builders. Would you agree with that, Michael? I'm just trying to work out whereabouts I am in the scale of things. Oh, hey, you're <laughs> up here. <laughs> no. um, so basically, in my experience, and just, this is just an example in Sydney, for example, um, a base budget, like, and like just not taking in onto any of those considerations that you've just spoken about, yeah. whether you're going up or out, or you know, because they do vary the price. But typically, like a base budget builder in Sydney would be about 1800 to... 2,700 okay. a metre squared. Um, medium to seven, somewhere like two seven to four and a half square metre and then four and a half a square metre plus. Would you agree with that sort of or? The, these two are probably a little bit high. Um, I would have this said, one? yeah, I would have probably really? said anywhere from about 1,500 to about mid twos. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't have gone as high as four and a half thousand, but once yeah. again, it really depends on the the quality of build. If if you want high end things and you want if you want to spend five or ten thousand dollars just on a bathtub, yes, you, you'll be looking at the premium. But yeah. it really comes down to what you're trying to achieve. So in my experience, there are develop um, sorry there are builders who are just accustomed with working with higher value properties, and as renovators, they're not the type of builders that you want to be dealing with. So I, I personally think, Michael, you're in, in the medium tier okay. in terms of your price range. That's where I would put, just personally um, think you are. Um, whether I'm true, um, correct or not is a different story. But um, yeah, you don't, as a renovator, you don't want to be um, basically targeting those premium end because they're going to be too expensive for you as renovators. So what you want to really try and target is this base or this mid-level. Mid um, if you're doing a low-budget you know, structural renovation out west, for example, let's say you go and buy an old house in Borkham Hills and you're going to add an, an extension on the back or up, whatever, my feeling is that you'll probably use more of a base budget. So you almost need to... Um, choose your builder also according to your suburb as well. So, Michael, that's why I'm saying I know that you're probably in this category because mm -hmm. you do a lot of building in the inner west mm -hmm. in more affluent inner city areas where it's, it's more this level. Yes. 
um, for renovators. Whereas if you are dealing in a house out west in, say, you know, Borkham Hills or wherever it may be, you're not going to be getting a mid-tier. You're probably going to be going with a cheaper, like a base budget builder. And that's all you need to do is you need to go with those base budget builders and then it's your job as renovators to come and tart the properties up and make, give them that wow factor. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, when you um, get a quote for the build-up stage, or the lock-up stage, should I say, and you've got the quotes for the plumber and the electrician, and then the renovator comes in and has takes over from that point, with the quotes that you've already got from the, blum the plumber and the electrician, would the renovator then get another set of quotes for the second part of the project, or would we negotiate with you to do a full quote for the whole project with the builder? That's really entirely up to you. Once again, it comes down to how far you want the builder to go. Yeah. Um, if you chose to take on the second part of the work yourself, then I recommend that you go straight to the same plumber, the same sparking, yeah. and get quotes to finish off their work. Could you then also approach the builder and say, look, would you continue working with me, with me in the capacity of um, project manager then Yeah, as on well? a supervision role, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. And for all the people in Brisbane, you have no choice but to do that, okay? So you need to, in Brisbane, you need to find a builder and that builder needs to um, sort of like assist you um, in some way, shape or form with the building process for all the Queensland people in the room. Okay, we'll take a quick question here. If we can speed up the questions. Yeah, yeah hi. Um, I'm interested to learn how you sort of negotiate and negate your uh, project manager versus builder uh, if the project manager is involved from an earlier stage in the construction or do you just come in at lock up and then project manage from there on. For instance, in more development sort of aspects, we've got a dedicated project manager. You might have one or two builders on a, on a larger scale project. How do you sort of negate that? Who, who's employing the uh, the project manager, the builder or the owner? Uh, well, the the owner in this case, in in my line of thinking of of the actual opportunity that I'm applying it to. Um, but I'd be interested to hear both. I'm not really following the question, so... A project manager often will um, employ the builder, for instance. Okay. Um, so where does the line of responsibility, like if you're concerned with uh, quality expenses and all that sort of thing, obviously the project manager would um, organise a bill of quants and all that sort of stuff. So that sort of treads on your ground, so to speak. Uh, so I, look, just so I make sure I understand this correct, you want to know what role exactly does the project manager play and what line of responsibility does he take as far as finishes? Is, is that the question? Not as finishes, Probably, uh, as a project. In, ter in sort of terms thing. of time cost, and, time, cost and quality control, is that what I'm understanding? That's right, yeah. So yeah. obviously for me as a professional renovator, as a developer, I want you to build the project as quickly as possible, as, as cost effectively as possible <laughs> and to a satisfactory quality level. So for me that's just part, that's an expectation of the builder. The quality level is, I guess in terms of the time, Michael is, is signed into a building contract which stipulate, stip, stipulates a certain period of time that must he or she must um, adhere to. And, in, and I guess in re respect to the cost, it's a fixed price contract. So, so you never enter into a relationship where, for instance, you're getting upfront costs and quotes and all that sort of sort of thing, and you employ a builder sort of to coordinate the materials and, and uh, trades that you've employed previously? You can, you can do that and if you're going to do that it all has to be agreed up front so that if I, Michael and I were working together I say look Michael I want to bring in some of my own tradies I obviously want you to supervise them so that would be part of our negotiations and that would just be a matter of you talking it through with the builder and him saying yes I'm happy to do that I'm not happy to do that if you want me to supervise then I need to make some money from that that project management so that's just it's just negotiations between two parties. Because you get the impression that yourself comes in quite early in the in the phase. Yeah and like Michael Michael would control. obviously know that, you know, as a professional renovator, I've got to get it, do it, the project as quickly as possible um, to the price that he's quoted and to an acceptable quality standard. So that would be an expectation that he would be aware of before the project actually commenced. And that's your, don't assume that, 
you have to basically have that convers all of you need to have that conversation with your builder. So you need to go to them now and you need to say, look, this is my first project, my first structural renovation as a professional developer. You know, I want you to help me to, to get this project delivered on time to the price that you've quoted and to a quality standard so that I can make actually turn it turn it around and make a profit margin so we can go do it all over again in project number two. So as long as you have those conversations and then Michael knows what my expectations are of him and so forth. It's when you don't have those conversations that it becomes an issue, lack of communication. The project builder will generally communicate with a builder and they'll sit down every week and say, look, this is where you should be at. There's generally a time frame on the larger jobs, so you know roughly where you should be at a specific time. If you're starting to fall off uh, a little bit, that's when everyone sits down and says, okay, we need to be here at this particular date and we're not and what's happened and how are we going to remedy to get back on track. So that generally happens on a weekly basis. All right, I'm going to have to um, stop mm. the questions there, if that's okay, because we're, we're not going to be here all night. So, um, are you going now? I'll stick around for a little bit. Okay, cool. Uh, anybody want Michael's number? Yes. Um, are you available for work, Michael? Because I know you're very booked out a lot of the time. Um, maybe for the end of the year we are. Okay, cool. So, Michael, what's your number? That's it, yep. Yep. It. <laughs> 0410. 0410. 10 Yep. 0006. Six. Okay, beautiful. All right, so if you want Michael, he's definitely a builder that I recommend. I only bring people, um, trades people up on this stage that I know and trust. So if you want to use um, my tradies, Michael services, then I know that you'll be, um, you will be able to sleep at night knowing that you're not going to have any um, rogue operator operating on your project. So no pressure there. But thank you, Michael. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to go through and talk about how you brief and manage tradies, okay? Um, tradie hours are 7 till 3 p.m., Monday to Friday. A lot of tradies are also going to want to work with you every Saturday as well. So as renovators, you're going to work on Saturdays? Try and avoid it at all expenses, okay? Um, the reason why there is a lot of issues is purely because of lack of communication. So what a tradie basically wants is they want to deal with a client who knows what they want. If you want to burn a tranny, keep changing your mind 50 million times. Um, they won't want to work you, with you ever again. So this is part of you being organised. Once you're organised and you know what you want, then you just basically deliver the communication down the line. Um, don't don't be a hassle in terms of consuming a lot of their time. You know, don't get don't get them to pick your tiles for you. That's your job as a professional renovator. Okay, don't keep phoning them every five minutes saying, "Oh, what this, what that," or because the, they will just absolutely hate it. Okay. Um, you know, in my experience, is tradies don't have a lot of temper. I mean, they, you know, a lot of them are reasonably calm, but when you just push, 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 at some point they have breaking point. Okay, so just try and just try and be really easy to deal with in that regard. Um, and the biggest thing for a tradie is that you have to pay them on time. It is the absolute bane of tradies. Now, you have to be on the same level as your tradespeople. As I said, there's no room for princesses or pompous snobs on a work site. You've got to basically understand that on a renovation site, a construction site, you're dealing with real people, um, people who, you know, get their hands dirty. So I quite find a lot of the people that I work with are quite humble in that regard. There's, they're just no, they are what they are. Um, there's no, no false pretenses. So what it means is for you as a renovator, if you are a slightly more affluent person or you're somebody who, you know, um, talks a bit, bit more posh or whatever it may be, that, you know, you sort of just have to bring, you have to bring, um, you just have to change your demeanour um, to suit a renovation site. You're, even the way you speak, your language changes a little bit, just a, a bit more casual, okay? I'm not saying being yob, I'm not saying go to the extreme and be a yobbo, um, but what I'm saying is there's just a fine balance in between um, that if you, if you understand what I mean. Friendliness goes a long way and get to know your tradie, get to know them a little bit. So this actually helps. Now why I encourage um, my tradies to eat at the same time? While they eat, guess what? I eat with them as well. So what, what I do is, you know, I'm always sitting at the tables with them, having a laugh, telling my pathetic jokes that nobody laughs at, whatever it may be, okay? And they can see that funny, yeah, Sheree is tough, she's firm, uh, she's a sweet person underneath and she's got a sense of humour, she's real. So, um, you know, pay attention to those small details. So quite often if I've just met a new tradie or I've got a brand new tradie work on site, I will just start up conversation with them during the break. I'll say, um, Tony, you got any kids? You married? You got any kids? You know, and you'll go, yeah, I've got, you know, three children, Isabella, Joseph, 
and Mary, whatever it may be, you know, and I'll say, oh, they're going to school or whatever, you know, just small talk. And then they'll say, yeah, you know, Isabella's starting school next Monday. I'm like, oh, fantastic. And then, you know, next Monday, I'll sort of try and remember, oh, hey, Tony, how was Isabella's first day at school yesterday? So, you know, what you can do, that's where your construction site diary is good. You can write Tony, children, Isabella, Joseph, Mary, for example. So it's just, you know, nobody pays attention to those site details. Okay, now when your tradie is rocking up, so you've awarded a trade person the job, okay, you've gone through that briefing process, you've given them that documentation, and when they come to work on their very first day, you need to induct them to the site. John, do I have my site induction video? Oh, where's John gone? Okay, he's gone. Um, so... I didn't give him cake. He <laughs> split. Uh, I had a little. I had a little video about my site induction. So here we go, John. Do we have the site induction video still here? Okay, no response. So what you've got a little checklist here, and basically what this checklist is is when a tradie turns up for work on Monday morning, whatever it may be, you know, you grab your little um, clipboard. So you'll have to go buy some clipboards for a few little pieces in your project management kit. And this is basically where you're going to go. You're going to go, Tony. Thanks for thanks for coming to work today. So all you're going to do is use this checklist. You're going to go, okay, name a person, Tony, blah blah blah, whatever his name is. Site induction date, 14th of May. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Oh, do you mind, guys, just for 20 seconds? Oh. Hello. Hello, monster. <laughs> hello. Hello. What you doing, honey? Nothing. Hey, do you want to tell these guys what do you want to be when you grow up? No. You told me last night you want to be a chicken farmer. <laughs> you still want to be a chicken farmer or a renovator? Both? Great, good answer. <laughs> Look, do you like everybody's flags? Say wave hello. Mwah. I haven't seen you for two days, have I? No, no. Show me, I want to see how much you've grown. Come here, come here, show me. Oh, you've grown this much. Have you been eating your wheat bits? Oh, that much? Wow. <laughs> you want to sit up here with mum? Yeah? Okay, cool. All right. You want me to make a little... Oh, you're getting into it, are you? <laughs> here, you want me to sit... I'll make this little seat for you here. You want to sit on my toolbox? No, you just want to stand with me, do you? Okay. Want to stand here? All right, great. All right, when you get bored, you just tell mum, okay? All right. Okay, I'm training a young. <laughs> All right, so when a, when a tradie comes out on site and you're doing your site induction, induction, all you're basically going to do is just get your site induction checklist so that all those templates have been done for you and what you're going to do is you're going to go, Tony, I just have to do a site induction. All your tradies know that this is a standard process on a building site. You're going to say, Tony, have you got your white card on you? He'll show it to you. Yes, fantastic. Um, have, you, have you got the appropriate safety equipment? So you're going to go through, you're going to look at their work boot, make sure if they're a painter, they've got rum, whatever it may be appropriate to their occupation. Um, Tony, so what you're going to go is you're going to go, oh, Tony, I'm just going to induct you to the site. So Tony, you, this is the front entry to the gate. Um, the portal loos are down in the back corner of the site over there. Tony, I have set up a meals area. So when you want to have your morning tea and your lunch, certainly feel free to sit over here. All of our tradies sit together. Um, there's a first aid kit. See the first aid kit? It's actually bolted to the fence there. If there's an accident, um, make sure you go to there in the first instance. If it's a minor accident, certainly help yourself to the first aid kit. If it's a major accident where somebody's seriously injured, the phone number is triple zero. And if you want to go to the local, the local hospital, there's an Nepean hospital down the road two kilometres. So in the first instance, come and grab me as a project manager if you need help. Um, the safety signs are here, port loos there. That's all you're doing. You know the same way that you go into an office and you base... Don't undo my fly. <laughs> Don't let me do a muppet. Um, so, <laughs> no, that's not the time. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm mean, funny enough. All right, so what you want to do is so you basically just go through. So you know the same way you go into a corporate office and they say the toilets are here, the tea, morning tea, the afternoon, like the, the tea room is here, the printer's here, that you're doing exactly the same thing on a construction site. So then what you do is you sign it, um, you sign it and basically they sign it, you sign it and you formally induct it to the person on the work site and it's that simple. You should file those. You should have one folder in your kit that says site inductions. Okay. Okay. 
Oh, dear. <laughs> okay. All right. Two ways you can manage your trade teams. You can have a, what's called a toolbox meeting. You can also have a daily briefing of, of, your, of your tradies as well. So basically what a toolbox meeting is, is um, Milan. Okay, ask Janine. Can you come and take Millie? Okay. So um, what a toolbox meeting is, is that have you ever gone to a construction site? This is my sister, by the way, guys. Um, so, <laughs> so my sister is my guardian angel. She wouldn't, uh, if I didn't have, oh, if I didn't have my sister, Okay, this is where you don't work with children. Okay. <laughs> they say don't work with animals or kids. Okay, Millie, come on. All right. She's half undressed me. Okay. Sorry, guys. Millie, come on. <laughs> okay, Muppet, come on. I'm going to play with you tonight, honey. Okay. That's the Muppet Show. Okay. <laughs> that mother-like daughter. <laughs> all right, my earpiece is around my ear now, um, around my chin now, but that's all right. Okay, so there's two ways that you can manage your tradespeople: a toolbox meeting or individual daily briefing. Does that look right? It doesn't feel right, but anyway, um, John, if I can help you, and if you can help me in that regard. Um, so what you want to do is a toolbox meeting. Have you ever driven past a construction site where basically you see just a whole heap of tradies standing around in a circle, just you know, standing around with a cup of coffee? Highly likely that they're having what's called a toolbox meeting, and that's where the builder or the project manager just says, "Hey guys, you know, today we need to get that detention pit installed. We need to get that area finished because tomorrow such and such is coming in. Okay, Tony, so what they tend to do is they just tend to go around in a circle. So the builder will basically point out any pertinent points on the building site. And then the tradies say, you know, Tony, the painter will say, look, I'm going to be painting this section today, blah, blah, blah. And then Joe, um, Joe the so the rock over cement render will say, oh, no, no, I was actually going to render that area today, so it's not going to be dry, you can't paint that. So they all, in a toolbox meeting, they sort of sort out problems themselves. Um, do the builders in the room uh, you do toolbox meetings? Yep, they work quite effective. It's just like, it's like, a, it's like a, the same way you have a weekly staff meeting in your office. It's exactly the same thing out on a construction site. The other way that you can do it is you can do a daily briefing of individual tradespeople, and this is my preferred method. Um, so what I do is when I rock up on site, you know, the tradies are, uh, tradies are on site at 7 o'clock in the morning, I'll rock up, I'll open the gates, they all disperse, like tradies aren't stupid, they know what they've got to do and where they're going to go, so they disperse to their own area of the site, and what I do is I drop my bag down my case, I get my construction site diary, I quickly rip around the site and say, okay, Tony, um, just seeing how you're going, what, what's the plan of attack for today? Um, is, you need, are you right for materials? Do you need me to order anything? Is there anything, you know, ev everything cool with you? And they'll say, yeah, sure, no, we're good. We're going to get this wall done today, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool, that's done. That person's done. I'll whip around. So I will just go around every single tradie on site. That normally takes me about an hour. By the time I sit there and have a laugh and whatever, it normally takes me an hour or two to get around all the tradies on site. And then as soon as I've done that, so if, you know, I could come back with like in my construction site list with a couple of things, order set need more tiles, whatever it may be, I'll then come back, um, sit at my project management desk, I'll start doing the scope of works documents, I'll order any materials that are required for the next day, and then I'm on the phone haggling with suppliers for my PC items and all that sort of stuff. Then before 3 o'clock, so normally I'll whip around the site about 1.30, 2 o'clock, and I'll just go back right around those tradies again, I'll go, say, okay, Tony, just preparing for tomorrow, is there anything you need? Did you get everything, did you get everything done that you needed to today? Any issues? No, Sheree, it was all good. And that's it. All right. So I prefer to manage my tradies like that. But as I said, if you don't want to whip around the whole lot, you can do that big group meeting for five, ten minutes at the start of the job and away you go. All right. Um, always insist on a fixed price for your job, so please don't go into anything, uh, any any labour costs where it is on an hourly basis. There are some trades where you're not going to have an option where you have to pay an hourly basis, but wherever possible, try and do a fixed price. Now, a trade is going to come out and they're going to say, look, I only work on an hourly rate. Things, um, uh, trades like carpenters, for example, um, they more than likely will try and get you on a, an hourly rate. Unless it is specific work that you can clearly define, there's no reason why they can't do a fixed price contract. So quite often, a lot of tradies will tell you an hourly rate, but you can negotiate a fixed price rate with them. So a great excuse to say is it's against company policy for us to do hourly rates. It's company policy that we always get a fixed price for the job. All right, so that get that skirts around that issue. When you say that, then they'll basically switch and they'll say, okay, I'll give you a, fi a fixed price for the quote. Okay. 
Now, there, are, there is a tra um, an occupation called a quantity, a quantity surveyor. A quantity surveyor, and this might be useful for you with your very first structural renovation, quantity surveyor is somebody who will actually cost up your whole project for you. So if you really want to have some um, assurances of what things are going to cost, um, engage a quantity surveyor. You'll give your architectural plans to them. They will measure all the quantities and all sorts of things, and basically they will cost the whole project up for you with their knowledge of what things cost in your your local area. So it might be worth the one and, uh, one and a half thousand if you're um, going to be building a 300,000 you know, structural renovation, then that's where you might warrant the expense to try, to try and get in a close proximity. Also, um, just one thing about the builders I forgot to mention to you is a quick, a really quick way, because at the moment you'll get your property DA approved and you have absolutely no idea what it's going to cost you from a construction point of view if you're doing a big structural renovation, correct? So what, a really quick way to work out, and look, don't use this all the time, it's, 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 it's something for you to work on, but what you basically can do is once you know if you're going to be using a base builder, a low budget builder, I'm sorry, base builder, a medium tier or a high end builder, you can normally take the square meterage of your new extension and you can multiply that building rate. So for example, if you're going to build a 120 square meter extension, so for me here, I would use Michael. Now if Michael quotes 3,000 a square meter for a building to build a property here in the inner city, I would go 3,000. I know that my new alteration addition is 120 square meters. Therefore, my building cost is going to be what? 360000 as a fully finished cost. That is a really quick way to work out a rough estimate. If you don't want to go down to the individual level, that is a really quick way to work out an approximate figure for your structural renovation. All right. Try and pay your tradespeople at a set. So we're talking about how to brief and manage people and um, manage people now, tradespeople coming onto the site. So if possible, try and um, pay your tradespeople at a set time and day of the week. Um, your trades will come to you because some, you know, trader will come on site. They will work for you one day a week and then they're gone. So you say to your tradespeople, I pay all the, my tradespeople at a set time and that's in your scope of works document. So I like doing it just at the end of the week. It wraps the week up. They all like that, you know, the money's in their account at the end of the week. Um, if they miss that, if they miss getting their invoice to you by the set time, like by basically by the time you leave site on a Friday afternoon, that's not your problem. They have to wait till the following week. So just try and avoid, you know, clumsiness on their parts. You know, you, that's your rules and try and stick by them because if you sort of keep stepping outside the rules all the time, then you're going to find this is going to overtake your life. Okay, um, don't pay more than the required deposit. There's some trades, like a lot of tradies are going to say, look, can I have an initial deposit? A lot of tradies won't. Um, certainly, um, trades like electricians and plumbers may ask for an initial deposit. Typically, 10% um, of, the, of, of the contract price is, is more than acceptable, 5 to 10% at the absolute most. So um, don't pay anything more than that. You'll have some tradies who, if they think you don't know anything, they'll come and ask you for like a 50% deposit straight up front. No go. Okay, so pay minimal deposit because what's happened to me in the past, in my very early days, I've paid money and I've never seen them again. All right, so I have lost money that way. Um, don't pay your tradespeople in advance. Um, somewhere along the line, as a professional renovator, you're going to get some tradesperson come up to me, uh, come up to you and say, look, is it possible that I could get this week's um, pay or get my, get my pay in advance? And same situation. I did that once to a tradie that actually I quite liked and I had worked with on a couple of jobs. And a lot of tradies are like normal people. They live week to week, day to day, unfortunately. Some, a lot of tradies just aren't good in managing their money. And this person, I actually, they asked for a $5,000 advance on their pay. They were doing a reasonably big job. This was a rendering job. And uh, guess what? I paid them out of, good, out of my good nature and I never saw them again. So don't do it. Just don't put yourself... What, so what, the, what is the line that when somebody comes and asks you to pay them in advance of work that's been completed, what's your line you're going to use? I'm sorry, I'd love to help you, Rocco, but it's against company policy. And to say, and look, we did this once, we never saw the tradesperson again, so the company policy was made that we never do that ever again. I wish I could help you. 
Um, age. Now you're going to be dealing with age, um, different uh, different nationalities, different ages of tradies. You've got to be careful when you're dealing with older tradespeople. Look, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them generally, but you've got to be careful because the reality is is that when you get older, your eyesight starts to deteriorate. Would you agree with that? I mean, I'm 41 now, and I've just noticed over the last six months that my eyesight is starting to deteriorate just now. So um, the reality is, old, the older you get, the, the more your eyesight goes. So you've got to be careful with this because a lot of older tradies who have been doing bricklaying and rendering and painting for 40 years can't suddenly see the defects in their own work. I had this issue on, uh, on one of my sites and my pinball job with a tradesperson that I absolutely loved. He was my all-time favorite person. His wife baked me cookies every single day. He'd bring them inside. He'd bring me like morning tea. Um, you know, he was, he'd say to me, you're the daughter. I never had like he had three sons he was trying to marry me off with his sons all sorts of stuff right I want you to be my daughter-in-law you're the daughter-in-law I never had and I absolutely loved him it was always the tradie that would come along give me you know I'd be sitting there like writing in my construction site diary on site and he'd be the little the one that always would come up and just give me a little a little like harmless peck on the cheek or something say good morning Cherie you know really nice person and unfortunately he was a renderer and he couldn't see the defects in his own work so I could clearly see the render defects and I kept saying to him, Rocco, I don't want a textured finish. I want a smooth finish on the render. And he's saying, this is smooth finish. And I'll say, look at the defects. Look, I can see the swells. Can you not see that swell? And he's like, what swell? And I'm saying, you got swells in your cement render. And I actually had to terminate him from the site. And it absolutely broke my heart. because all my. But at the end of the day, it's a business. Okay, so you just got to be careful when you're dealing with older people. You'll also find that older people will come out and they'll say, I've been a bricklayer for 40 years. I've been doing this since I was 20. That's fine, but unfortunately, they're also working on the building code standards from the dinosaurs as well. So they don't move with the times, okay? So you've got to be really careful because it's like, you know, what's that old saying? You can train a dog or something. What is it? Can't, can't teach an old dog new tricks, all right? So same thing with tradies. Just so you've got to be particularly careful with older tradies because they just don't move with the building regulations. And the young ones are going, yeah. Okay. Okay, different cultures. You've got to understand that you are going to be working with renovators with lots of different nationalities. Um, look, I've come to, I've come to um, work with a lot of tradies. I work with a lot of Lebanese people, a lot of Chinese. Um, typically, you'll find that concreters, form workers, paving guys tend to be a lot of Lebanese. I love it when you don't tell them that you speak their language as well. So that's definitely something you keep up your sleeves. So, um, you know, I've heard of all sorts of stuff um, being said on site. And I always love at the end, like you don't tell them, I can speak Arabic. And I, I tell them at the end, you know, when they're leaving and they think, you know, just Aussie chick. And then you say, Min shufak ba jahen Josh. And they go, what, like that? And basically I said, see you later, you donkey. And, um, <laughs> and they basically, woo! And so they're like, they're very careful about what they say the next day. So, uh, and that's how like you can have fun, like you have a real lot of fun. So, and like, you know, even with Chinese, a lot of Chinese people, a lot of pl really good plasterers are Chinese people, Chinese teams. And so I always say to them, how do you say hello in Chinese? And they'll say, blah, 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 whatever. And I'll go, oh, that's too hard. Can you give me an easier word? Whatever it may be. So it's good if you can even start just learning the hello, thank you, and goodbye in their language as well. You've got to understand too that, so some of the things I've picked up, like Lebanese, they love to feed you on site. Um, the way that a lot of, um, have got any Lebanese people in the audience? Nice, kifik. Um, so um, basically, so you know, a, a Leb the way Lebanese express their pre um, appreciation is through food and stuff like that. So needless to say, they're always shoving, shoving mandarins and things in my mouth, and that's that's cool. Chinese, on the other hand, so you encourage them to sort of sit with you, and a lot of them won't sit with you. They like to um, congregate in, in in basically their teams and things. So you've got to be very respectful of that um, on a work site. Each each nationality to their own. So that's a real part, an interesting part of renovating you're just going to see all different quirky things about different cultures okay <laughs> how to be a great project manager so what you want to do in terms of being a project manager you want your role is essentially to gather a good team together oversee the construction program program schedule the tradespeople, and make sure materials are on site when required and maintain quality 
control and cost control. So the three critical factors with your renovation that you need to be on top of are that quality, time and cost control. Now very simple to manage, obviously with your time control, how are you going to manage that as renovators? Yep, with your construction project plan. So you need to basically just work to this. So every day just check where you're tracking with your construction project plan. If something has slipped, go home, quickly jump onto Microsoft Project, just update the slip so that basically you print it out and you've got your up-to-date construction program. It just, when you also are on top of this sort of stuff, it just makes you realise, hey, I've got to speed up work, I need things to hurry up a little bit more quicker on site. Okay. Quality control. Um, as I said, your spirit level, just being on site is definitely going to help you with your quality control and obviously your spirit level, just going around and checking on work as it goes through. The reality is you're never going to build a house that's 100% perfect. That is the real reality. You could go to my Leichhardt house right now and there's lots of defects and I will certainly show you those tomorrow. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is I found that when I'm not on site, when I'm particularly doing a big structural renovation as the project manager, when there's no builder there, that's when you've got a very high chance of things going wrong. So I'm going to show you some things, some things in that house tomorrow where I haven't been on site. So I've actually shut that site down just because of my speaking commitment. So I will go back to that at some stage. But pretty much I'm going to show you some things tomorrow of crazy things that people have done on that site that I will basically go back and rework from things they've done when I haven't been on site. So my issue is, you know, I'm on a plane around the country, um, you know, one or two days a week. And so I'm relying on tradespeople being there. And, you know, again, if you're Working with different cultures, they just have different ways of doing things. So it does help to be on site if you're doing a big structural reno. If you can't be on site for the majority of your project in a structural, I would strongly urge you to engage a builder to do it for you. And you've seen that for me, for to get engage a builder to do a two hundred thousand dollar structural reno, you know, a forty thousand dollar profit margin, you know, the reality is that builder is going to be able to do, build it cheaper and quicker for you as inexperienced renovators anyway. So definitely do that. I think the smartest students of mine are the ones who are engaging builders on their structural renos. Okay. If you can, try and get into the habit while you're on site of taking photographic just photos of the site at different stages. Where this can come in useful is that if there was ever an accident on site, sometimes you might to prove, have to prove something saying, look, I did actually have safety barricade tape around that sort of pit at that time. And if you've got some photographic evidence of that, that always helps in the unfortunate situation that you ever have to go to court. But it's also good just to look back on time, have a photographic record, particularly where it's used useful to take a photographic record is when you're doing cosmetic renovations and you don't actually have any um, construction drawings. So where, for example, you could get tripped up is, you know, you get your plumber in to do all the roughing, you know, all the roughing of the plumbing pipes in the bathroom. You know, you've got this all running between your timber studs like that, blah, blah, blah. Your pipes are all going through. Guess who comes in next? Your plasterer. Your plasterer comes in, sheets up the wall, puts a waterproofing membrane in, your tiler comes in, they put the tiler on, then your plumber comes in and says, Cherie, where would you like your soap dish to go? I want it right here. And suddenly, so, you know, Mark the Plumber dr drills in straight through the plumbing line and guess what? you got a water leak. Now, this is particularly prevalent with cosmetic renovations, okay? So, good idea that when you rough in your electrical lines or your plumbing lines for low-budget cosmetic renos, take a step back, take a photo, and basically that way you'll know roughly where the position of your plumbing lines are and your electrical lines when you can't see them. <clears throat> okay, um, look, there's, I'm not gonna, just going to skip through a few things because there's lots of just journal reading notes in this, insur um, in this manual. I just want to skip across to the big things. Um, so if you can, try and allow in your financial feasibility to allocate a certain amount of money in your feasibility for the coffees and the teas and the cakes, those refreshments on site. Um, quite often what you can do, it's just worth the investment sometime of actually just going and buying your own kettle, having some foam cups, some sugar and some milk. And, you know, that way you can even reduce the expense and the traders can help themselves at any time of the day. So make sure you do that because, you know what, it's those tiny little things that, get, that can make so much much difference between happy workers on a site. Um, show your appreciation for jobs well done. This is, um, did you all get my video last week about the little tokens of appreciation? Um, so basically what, so who didn't get that video? 
It was emailed out to all of you. And they must be going into your junk folders. So you need to check that. And if you're not getting those videos, please email our office because we need to work out why you're not getting them. So what I do is I always do little small little tokens of appreciation for tradies. So what you do is, you know, you buy these bulk packs. You go into the news and you get a crazy cleanse by these you know, a 20 pack of thank you cards or 10 packs for like $5. So just go buy a quantity of those. And any tradie that does a really good job and a tradie that you want to keep for your next projects, write them out a simple little thank you card. Like here, I pretty much, and I'll pass this around. So if we can please make sure um, you don't keep it. Because um, the door handles went missing yesterday. Well, one of them went missing. That's all right. Don't worry. Don't sweat the small stuff. Um, dear Tony, just wanted to say, <laughs> dear Tony, just... It's upstairs. <laughs> okay, cool. Dear Tony, just wanted to say thank you so much for the great job you did on my Bradford Street project. I look forward to working with you again on my next project, Cherie. All right? And just five little $2 tickets. So when Tony's about to leave the project, so I'll just put that in an envelope like that. And I'll pass this around so you can have a look. You can even copy it. I should do a template for that. Um, <laughs> Um, so basically, so I'll pass it around. So when Tony's leaving the site, you know, he's packed up. So most traders will always say goodbye to you if they like to you. So they'll go and pack up your tools and I'll basically say, like, Tony, thanks so much. I'll show you saying thank you so much. You did an awesome job. Hey, look, there's just something little for it. Open it in the car on your way home. Don't open it now. You'll embarrass me. But open it in that in the car. It's just a little token to say thank you. And nobody ever does that. And it goes, it cost me $11 for that. It's nothing, but that's the reason why, you know, Tony and lots of tradies love working with me because I pay attention to the small details. Don't underestimate them. Okay, make sure you lock your equipment away at night. Um, so you're going to have to find a dedicated shed or a dedicated room. Quite often if I'm dealing in an inner city location, I will just allocate a room and I'll put a padlock on that room within the house and that will get locked up at night. So um, as I said, renovation sites are a haven for thieves and they will steal anything and everything. Saying that also, you want to get on the good side of your neighbours when you're renovating. So what I always say to them, look, you know, Rosa, would you mind, um, this site's obviously undergoing renovation. Would it be okay if you just hear anything at night? Here's my phone number. Would you mind giving me a call? So needless to say, you know, my ro no, Rosa, my uh, neighbour at Leichhardt phones me. You know, I normally get a phone call from her once every six weeks saying, I heard something in your house last night. So uh, I got a phone call. I was in Perth and she said, this somebody in your house that didn't really help at that time so um, yeah now in terms of being an effective project manager you want to stay on top of your records okay so I can't stress on that a few of the people this weekend have said uh, Paul said yesterday stay on top of your paperwork so it can get out, get out of control for you as renovators you can get bogged down in the paperwork so maybe you can even delegate this, that to somebody else your husband your wife your teenage daughter can log your expenses whatever it may be so when you're incurring these expenses and you're updating your expenses every Friday night, what are you going to do? You're going to pay your tradies, but what you, are you going to do in terms of your financial feasibility? You're going to update it. So I actually developed, um, I developed a new spreadsheet recently, which was the running cost sheet. Did you all get that? Yep. Okay. If you if you didn't let us know, but um, basically what it is, it was a it was a spreadsheet where you log the individual cost. Okay. So like you know the thirty dollars here, the sixty dollars there, whatever it may be. What you do is you then update those costs into your financial feasibility because at the end of every week you want to know where you're tracking to budget. Okay. If you're a thousand one thousand two hundred over budget, do you think you're going to be more conscious of that in your negotiations the week after? So just keep your um. You don't want to get to the end of your renovation only to find out that you went $6,000 over on a $30,000 reno. Okay, working with builders. So we've, we've spoken at length about um, uh, working with builders. I am going to get some more details sent out to you in that regard. So what I want to do is I want to uh, skip that. And uh, just one thing I will say about builders, you know what? You can incentivize builders as well. Again, this is something that a lot of people don't do. They don't provide incentives to their builders. So you could go to Michael and say, Michael, how long is it going to take you to build this structural reno? Michael might say 12 weeks. You say, okay, Michael, can you, if you do it in 16 weeks without sacrificing the quality, if you can do that, I'm going to give you a ticket, a, a ticket overseas to Bali for a family of four, might be two and a half thousand dollars, whatever it may be, if you can do it four weeks early without sacrificing the quality. Because for you as a renovator, if that property is costing you five thousand dollars a month, you're only incentivizing them two and a half, you're two and a half thousand dollars up. It means you can also get your profits out of the deal, get the property on the market sooner. So don't overlook the power of incentivizing people. Nobody ever does it.
Okay, sourcing your materials. Look for creative ways to get your materials at, at absolute rock bottom price. So your objective as renovators now, professional developers, is to get your materials as close to cross price as possible. Now, this is definitely where you haggle, okay? Be careful about where you haggle with your trades. People like definitely um, try and bargain, but don't screw them down to the absolute dollar because then they won't want to do good work for you. That's the reality. But where you are supposed to really negotiate is on your materials, your PC items, your bathroom your taps, your tiles, all sorts of the, the physical materials you need in your project. So you're never to pay retail price again. Your objective is to get your materials as close to cost price as possible. So a couple of strategies that I have. First of all, this is where your company name is beautiful. You ring up and do the... Um, you ring up suppliers and you say, hi, I'm Cherie from City Living Property Developments. Can I have a builder's price please on? whatever it may be, blah, 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 blah. So don't, don't fear asking for builder's price. At the, rea the reality is you are all going to be builders. We're not saying you're licensed builders, but you are all in now in the construction industry. You are building houses. So you are entitled to a builder's price. So have the courage to ask for that because I've, I don't think I've ever been questioned on that in the whole time that I've been renovating. Okay. Um, never tell suppliers you're an owner-occupier renovator. So don't ever say, I'm renovating my own house because they will treat you then as a real retail consumer. When you're a retail consumer, you'll pay retail price. Another strategy is to do a bulk order. So when you do that property inspection, you're going to know you need two taps, two basins, one, two toilets, whatever it may be. So if possible, try and um, deal with suppliers like Harvey Norman Commercial, which are a one-stop shop because they will give you much better discount on an order that represents 20000 versus an order that represents $500. So try and identify those suppliers which are a one-stop shop that you can get that bulk order. Um, surf the internet for suppliers. Now look, I'm um, just give you a tile example. The tiles that you're going to see on my Leichhardt um, project tomorrow morning. Um, basically, those I had a sales rep come and see me. She said these are beautiful tiles and I agree they were beautiful tiles. They retailed for $175 a square metre here in Australia, so they were really expensive. Now for the quantities that I need, so I, um, I combined both projects. That's another great way to drive your materials down. If you're doing two cosmetic renovations at the same time, you get bulk materials. You can also also send one tradesperson to the other site. So you can say, finish this job and you can actually go to the other site. I'll give you two jobs to do, not one. So I use that example in Pimble where I had to get both houses rendered, the Pimble and the Leichhardt one. He quoted 40000 on one job, 30000 on the other site. I said, if you do both, how much will you do both for? $50,000, $20,000 discount straight off the bat. So if you can manage and you can afford to do two or three cosmetic renovations at the same time, you can be guaranteed that your per unit cost on your renovation is going to come in a lot lower. So on these particular tiles, they retailed for $170, $175 a square metre. It was too expensive. What I did is I got on the internet. Um, the actual rep, she actually had a little sticker on the back that said made in China. So they knew that I, I knew they came from China. So I got on the internet and I spent like three, four hours, like half a day surfing the internet, going through all these tile shops um, in China. And I actually located the supplier of this particular exact tile. So I sent them an email saying, I need 1,200 square metres of this particular tile. Will you send them to Australia? And basically, to cut a long story short, about eight, seven or eight, nine emails went um, backwards and forwards over the, the course of two days. They said, yes, we can ship, blah, 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 how long, all that sort of stuff. I ended up landing those tiles. So those tiles that retail for 170, 175 a square metre here in Australia, I landed them in Australia in Sydney for US $17 a square metre and by the time I paid the logistics, the tax, the tariffs, all that sort of stuff, they worked out in the conversion on the currency, it worked out to be $36 a square metre. So um, overseas material, overseas suppliers are a great way to get your materials quite cheaply. Um, countries such as Bali, um, Thailand, uh, a lot of those Asian sort of countries are great ones to go and buy um, some materials. Now be careful what materials you buy. You don't want to buy any, any PC items or any materials that have obviously an electrical cord. You don't really want to even go, um, you know, some taps, a lot of taps now you can't buy from overseas. There's a special rating, a Wells rating here in Australia now. So what I would say, if you're going to go overseas to buy materials, certainly buy pavers, tiles, you can buy stone baths as long as they've got the right waste. Um, so you can buy some of those hard gazebos, all sorts of things, glass, timber tiles, all of those are great, just don't buy anything 
think that you've got to plug in or relies on, on water primarily. So make a holiday, go to Bali, take the family, spend a few, take a few days off there, go get a hire a driver for fifty dollars a day, and you can basically bring all of this stuff in. Um, I don't know if you've seen, if, if you've seen you know, that stone bath that I do in some of my projects. Guess how much you can buy that bath for in Bali. I know because I was in Bali last year and I seriously considered order, ordering a whole um, container load. Two hundred dollars. They retail here for three to four thousand dollars. In um, Domain, I think has that bath for three or four thousand. So you can go to Bali and yeah, buy them for two hundred dollars. By the time you land them here, it's about a thousand dollars. So the actual shipping is more expensive than the product. But you go there. Um, some of my um, one of my students did a big renovation at Glen Haven had a big gazebo so you can go buy those gazebos here you'll pay 20 grand over in Bali you'll pay a thousand dollars so you know big this does that work does that warrant a jumping on a plane for eight hours having some fun and basically like picking up a gazebo shipping it back you're gonna like have a holiday and get it for like a fraction of the price and so if also, um, yeah, so yeah, just cut the kitties and over there you get the dry, um, you hire the drivers, they're more than willing to drive you around for like $40, $50 a day, which they're absolutely tickle pink and they'll just take you wherever you want to go. I'll just ask you if you're yep. oh, that's okay. Thanks. Um, I've actually got a supplier who supplies me with a lot of, um, basins and things like that and she gets a lot of them from overseas yes yeah, they all do and the only thing she said sometimes is if you are in a hurry and you're trying to do it yourself it's with our customs here can take a really long time mm -hmm. that's the only thing and there's certain materials that won't be allowed through with customs yeah um but yeah that was the biggest thing we found that and sometimes six months. yeah some of them were even taking up to six months oh. on on stock so Okay. And then it wasn't much of a saving. <laughs> yeah. So, All right. Yeah. Well, I know that like Kokomo Living, um, one of our suppliers, they import the stone baths and they, they were selling them to our customers for about 1600 So they were making like five or $600 profit. Um, but, you know, if you've got a little bit of lead time, you know, this is where you can actually um, sort of um, start to form your own inventory. So like I've got a, a story shed in Balmain that's full of all sorts of things um, that I picked up on sales tables, you know, all those sorts of things. So yeah, it's something to definitely be mindful of. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, look, you've got to be careful about what you do buy overseas because not all suppliers uh, you know, do the right thing. So there are um, logistical companies that can get involved, companies like Siva Logistics, who can act as the middleman. So instead of you just paying the money in good faith and praying that they turn up, you can pay them to those logistic companies and they actually handle, they're the middleman who, tra who basically handles the transaction from start to finish. Okay, um, look in industrial states, a great way to get your materials cheaper, so I'll just keep moving if that's okay. A great way to get your materials cheaper is to look in industrial states for those small businesses. So what you want to avoid is the big retail chains. So those industrial states have glass suppliers, taps, tiles, you'll find a lot of those little um, overseas importers, um, so they've got no signage whatsoever. So in your local area, start driving around and familiarising yourself with what suppliers are there because these little, in fact, um, little industrial factories don't have the big corporate overheads that these bigger companies have, so you can get your materials cheaper. Okay, make stores compete against each other. This is what I used to do in my early days. I'd make a shopping list of all the stuff that I need. I would actually take it for one supplier, I'd say, and I'd email it through so I didn't have to deal with anybody. And, and if you can, try and avoid going into a store to basically negotiate with somebody face to face because sales um, people in stores are trained to determine what, how hard or easy you're going to be to get money out of. So when they don't have that interaction, they can't gauge what you look like. It's very hard for them to do that. So I like to do a lot of my negotiating by phone it also means I can stay on site so go and find out what materials you want first what models and brands make a note of that and then you jump on the phones so what I used to do is I used to make a shopping list I take it to the first supplier and say can you please quote on this I would take that quote to the next supplier I'd say look I've received this quote on these items can you beat this they would always beat it and then you take it to that quote to the third supplier you say can you beat this quote they would basically say, yep, I can beat that. You take it to the fourth and they'd say, oh no, I can't beat it. So normally in my experience is when you start getting down to the fourth, fifth supplier, that's when it starts to get really, really tight. And when they start saying, no, I can't beat it, you know you've pretty much got as close to wholesale price as possible. So I just, make, I just call that shopping, shopping the suppliers or shopping the quote.
All right, so that's a great way because your objective, every dollar you save is an extra dollar profit of earned in renovating land. Okay, the time poor phone call. I love doing this um, and I do this literally every day. This is where I ring up the supplier so I know, let's say, for example, I want to order some pool tiles, an Azari pool tile number, you know, model number 345. I will ring up three tile suppliers. I'll say, hi, I'm Cherie from City Living Property Developments. Look, I'm a builder on site. I can't get off site. So I'm just ringing three suppliers today. Um, whoever gives me the best price for um, some Azari pool tiles, I'll give you the model number. Whoever gives me the best price for those, I'm just going to place the order with them first thing tomorrow morning. Fortunately, I don't have time to get off site. I don't have time to play any games. So whoever gives me the best price, I'm going to give them that order. What it does, it cuts out all the game playing. They get straight to the point. They go, she knows she's not mucking around. She wants to do business. What's the best price? So you've got the scripts in your manuals for that. So try and um, just even have a practice run. Ring up three suppliers on a cooktop. Ring up the good guys and just do that. Say, look, I want Smeg number 114 cooktop. I'm going to ring three suppliers. Whoever gives me the best price, I'll do the deal. And see what the variance in price is that you get. Okay. Um, source materials from the Trading Post. The Trading Post newspaper no longer gets in, um, printed, but it's still online. And the Trading Post is a great way to get some really, um, some of those quirky materials like insulation, roofing materials, um, all sorts of things that you can get from the Trading Post. So don't overlook the Trading Post. They're called trader ads, and they're basically they don't have you know low overhead, so you can get your materials cheaper from there as well. Um, auction houses, you've all heard of sites like eBay, um, Gray's Online. So you can certainly get a lot of good renovation materials but keep in mind um, there's a time and place for auctions. My experience with auctions they're great for low budget cosmetic renos so those greys on lines all that sort of stuff where you're not being too particular but if you're doing nicer houses you're not going to be shopping in online auction sites that's the reality. So a lot of discontinued stock tends to go to the um, to those auction places like greys on lines or even the big auction and houses that you know you go in physically and inspect the products and just a lot of stock that doesn't sell. Now Proctor stock doesn't sell for a reason okay it's either because it doesn't look nice just doesn't look good it's not in fashion whatever it may be so just be conscious of that I certainly use eBay a lot for fireplace surrounds and things like that so if you were to get on eBay if I quickly jump on now I'll just do a random test You're looking for a fireplace surround Right, so eBay, you know, you can go right now. eBay has a, um, a building, a category called building materials. And what happens is a lot of those weekend warriors, you know, the renovators who think they're professional but not really, they underestimate or quite often they overestimate their quantities. So they're left with two pallets of pavers at the end of it. So if you've got a small job, like particularly this is great for low budget cosmetic renos, keep an eye on the building materials section of eBay because you can get some really great bargains on eBay. eBay is the place to buy. It's not the place to sell. Would you all agree with that? You get next to nothing for e stuff on eBay. All right. Trade suppliers. What we're going to do now is give you your trade packs. Okay, everybody's got their trade packs. Everybody, anybody not get a trade pack? Okay, great. All right, guys, so I'll quickly go through this with you. Um, this is your renovating for profit trade card. What this just identifies you as is a renovating for profit graduate. You'll see that in your folder, you've got a series of letters from different suppliers. So this is an evolving group. A you blend well. Um, so our major supplier in our trade group is Harvey Norman Commercial. And basically, you now have the ability to get anywhere between uh, 20% to 45% off recommended retail price, depending on what um, particular brand of item that you want. So you're really buying at the rates of big developers now. Big developers typically play cost price plus 3%. You're now paying cost price plus 5% in that, that vicinity. So they don't make a lot of money from you in that regard. Um, they also, to be honest, completely honest with you, Harvey Norman Commercial, and I need to mention this to you, they do find our graduates a little bit troublesome in the, in the respect 
that they're used to dealing with big developers, like one person who will place an order for 100 valves in one hit. They know what they want, they go and they place the order. Um, we've had a lot of students who've gone into Harvey Norman Commercial in all the various branches around the country and um, spent copious amounts of hours being indecisive about what they do, what they don't want, and they don't even give them, they, they submit a quote, they don't even give them the courtesy of you know getting back to them and saying, no, look, I don't want to go ahead, whatever. So needless to say, there's been a lot of people that have wasted the consultants' times of Harvey Norman Commercial. They're locked doors to the public, so you have to be trained to get in. Um, so if I can just ask you to be mindful and respectful of the consultants' times at Harvey Norman Commercial, they'll, they're more than willing to help you in any way, shape or form, but just don't um, waste their time. Also, because of the good rates that you're getting, we'll f um, we had some feedback. Some students were then going and shopping, the shopping, taking their quotes and trying to get better quotes elsewhere as well. So it almost came to the point where we almost lost the Harvey Norman arrangement, and I basically had to beg them to say, look, please keep this. You know, I'll make sure this is pointed out in our workshop. So if you just be mindful of that, because I don't want a couple of people to spoil it for the whole country. So they've done the right thing, but we're very fortunate to get those sorts of rates. And as I said, they're used to dealing with these people who um, just place, you know, big orders as opposed to small two or three thousand dollar orders. So what you do is um, we've got this list here. So um, basically what we've done in this group, we've done all the sort of big brands that we can. Um, we've certainly um, continuing to work on this as we speak. And so you, we've listed, basically identified all the materials that you're going to need in the renovation process. And we're trying to appoint a range of supplies, a number of supplies for all, um, all of those materials in each state of, state of Australia. So it's very much a largely evolving group. We're currently recruiting for a full-time person in our office to basically handle nothing but our national trade group. So if there's anybody looking for a, a job in the meantime who wants to talk to us about that certainly let the graduate support managers know and, and we'll follow through with that. But um, uh, so, you know, we're obviously looking for somebody to come on board full time to go out and do all of the negotiating on behalf of our students. So, needless to say, when this person comes on board, uh, we'll be sending letters through to you. We're hoping, hoping to be able to be sending like three, five letters through to you every single week, week saying this supplier's now come on board, this one, this one, this one. So, we need your help in this regard. Obviously, we've got Sydney covered, but for everybody in the other interstate locations like Perth, Melbourne, South Australia, Vic, we have absolutely no idea who all those local suppliers, who the local nursery is, it's extremely hard for us. So if we can ask you to help us to help you, if you just send us an email saying, please target this supply, this person, this person, this company, you know, this person in Geelong, whatever it was, Geelong or whatever it may be, um, if you tell us uh, how to not win friends in Melbourne. Um, so if you, if you tell us who they are, then we'll go and target them for you. We have a big, thick template in our office for our trade proposal. So it gets, a document gets sent to these suppliers telling them what renovating for profit's all about, who the demographics of our students are, all that sort of stuff. And then we, we try and make it as easy as possible for these suppliers to come on board. So if you help us in that regard, that would be great. So what you do is you get your letters, you print, you take your letters to um, out of your folders whenever you need any of these suppliers. All you need to do is show them the renovating for profit card that you're a graduate. You take it in with your letter. So for example, if you're going to Kennard's Hire, um, take your renovating for profit card, the Kennard's Hire a letter, you just present it in the counter and then they'll apply your discount. So there's no, it's not a hard system in terms of rebates and I didn't want to get into any of that. It's just you present the letter, they apply the discount at the checkout. As simple as that. In Harvey Norman Commercial, they'll set up your own cash COD account. So none of it goes through the renovating for profit account. So enjoy shopping with those guys. Um, so as I said, we'll continue to try and negotiate as much and try and get as many supplies. So my goal, um, my staff are aware that this year my goal is to have a minimum a minimum of 300 suppliers in that trade group by the end of this year. So I hope we, we will be in a position to start pumping some great letters through to you with some trade discounts. All right. Any questions on step number seven before we end that? So really managing project, managing your sites is not that hard. It's just about self-organisation, self-discipline, making sure clear communication exists and that's about it. All right. Any questions on seven? One question. Hi Sherry, um, I just wanted to quickly ask about the quotes. Um, you know how you said you get three to five quotes. Should you then, as um, sorry, as a courtesy, um, should you then call back the other 
tradies and then just say, look, thanks very much. Nobody ever does that. Absolutely. Yep. Because reality is you may need to phone that same person the next time for the next job. Yep. Okay, quick question there. Uh, Just very quickly, if you can't possibly physically get into these trade groups to buy these things, how can you use your card and letter of introduction? Um, so you're saying maybe you live in a regional area, is that yes. what you're thinking? Yes. So um, you basically just ring them up and say, look, I'm a renovating for profit graduate okay. and you can fax or email the letter through to them and Great. that will be fine. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we're going to go through a uh, quick question here. How long the, till, till the day you die? Oh, that's a good Thank you. Yep, so there's no time limit on it. So hopefully, if you know, if renovating for profit still exists in 20 years, hopefully we'll have about 3,000 suppliers at that time. Okay, cool. All 